Essentials of Health Information Management, Principles and Practices, Second Edition, Chapter 9, Legal Aspects of Health Information Management. So this presentation is going to cover the legal aspects, and when we discuss or address legal aspects of HIM, um, it makes us think about laws. And when we talk about laws, your book addresses that as being a rule or that is passed by a legislative body um, and that is enforced. And when in violation, there are penalties um, to be addressed. I mean, there's several types of laws. You got civil law and you got public law. Um, under civil law, this is dealing with um, private individuals um, and um, torts and contracts fall under civil law, dealing with uh, individual rights. So torts is those suits they bring against um, a, uh, for wrongful acts, and then you got contracts that you have between private parties. Now, when, public, when we're talking about public law, then we're looking at like criminal laws, and then we're looking at regulations. And when you have a complaint that's brought against individuals or in a court case, you have what we call a plaintiff and a defendant. Uh, and when we have a plaintiff, that's that person who is bringing that complaint against that defendant or that person for whom that complaint brought. Uh, and the burden of proof is going to be on the plaintiff. This kind of case usually is initiated by the attorney filing that uh, complaint um, or serve, serves that defendant, you know, serve those papers. Um, also involved in this process, your book tells you, is the uh, process of discovery. And when that is occurring, this is when there are some information gathering that's occurring. Um, and they can do it in two, two different forms. They can do an interrogatory or um, they can do a deposition. Your interrogatory is more like a question answer type thing that's written down um, versus a deposition where they're actually uh, obtaining statements from the individual. Uh, and of course, the deposition is a, uh, usually a lot more preferable. Um, than the in, uh, interrogatory because you can just get the well. Well, with the interrogatory, they can kind of craft statements as they wish. But when in a uh, in a deposition, they, the the uh, person you're asking the questions don't have time to do that, so they can kind of discover um, weaknesses or, or, or different things that's really actually going on um, when they're trying to obtain this information. Uh, in the healthcare industry, most likely you're going to see civil cases, like for healthcare fraud or, or something like that. All right. Now, your book also talks about where laws uh, initiate from, or the sources of law. Um, and you have your constitution, your U.S. constitution, your state constitutions, and you have administrative laws, case laws, and statutory laws. Um, when we're talking about administrative laws, we're looking at government agencies um, that put forth re uh, regulations. For example, like your um, Code of Federal Regulations, a lot of rules and stuff go through the CFR. Um, even when we have the, the information going on about ICD-10, for example, um, it went through your uh, Code of Federal Regulations. In your Figure 9.1, um, in chapter 9 on page 266, um, it gives you some of the things that are covered um, in your Code of Federal Regulations or USA CFR. Um, we actually had a discussion on this um, back when we were talking about conditions of participation uh, through CMS and we discussed the CFR. Okay, so that might be may seem familiar to you or ring some type of bell. Uh, so that's um, administrative law. Then you have case law. This stems from court cases, uh, decisions that are made during court cases and that are applicable to uh, set a precedent to other cases that follow. Um, and so you create um, law that way. Or case, another word for case law is common law. Um, you also have um, statutory law 
that comes through legislative bodies like Congress, right? And when we talk about um, this type of law, this is where we can have a discussion on the statute, what we call statute of limitations when people bring uh, a suit. Um, there's usually a time period in which that has to be done, and this can vary uh, from state to state what that time period um, may be. Now, um, you have um, things like malpractice suits that can be brought, um, and therefore you have your physicians that take get, get uh, malpractice insurance, medical malpractice insurance to help cover them in the uh, instance that this occurs due to uh, some negligence on their part, and your book defines negligence as that failure to exercise the degree of care considered reasonable under those uh, circumstances in the context of what's going on, all right? And so they get this malpractice insurance to help them cover damages uh, and defense costs, okay? Um, going back, um, one of those uh, sources of law being that of the case law, there are certain principles um, that come from case law. Um, there, I'd like to cover briefly here. Um, there are a lot of Latin terms, um, and the first one is res geste, which means things done, um, and pretty much says that hearsay statements uh, made during an incident are admissible as evidence. You got res ipsa loquitur, all right? The thing speaks for itself, um, meaning that something is self-evident, like a surgical instrument left in a patient's body cavity. Um, there's nothing you can argue about that. The instrument is there, so it speaks for itself. Res is its uh, locator. Res judicata, the thing is decided, meaning once that court, competent court makes that final conclusive decision, that's it. That's the end. You can't do anything with that. All right, and from there you have respondent superior. This is what says that Anything that an employee does in terms of conduct under the rim or umbrella of their employer, then the employer is going to be responsible or going to be legally responsible. So it responded superior says, let the master uh, answer. Fair decisive, to stand by things decided, right, um, means that it is a doctrine of precedent and court to adhere to the previous ruling. We just kind of talked a little bit about that. So um, once there's a previous rule, that's what's going to decide things, okay? Um, and then you have, dealing with your subpoenas, you have uh, a subpoena ad testa patendum and a subpoena deuces tecum. Um, with the first one, your subpoena ad testa patendum is when um, you have a court order it says that individual has to come in and testify during that um, court case, all right? And if they don't come, they're in contempt of court. Whereas your subpoena deuces teacher is dealing with a written uh, command or direction for a person to appear in court with documents, all right? So usually, and the medical records will be that document in the, in the context of, of our discussion. So subpoena ad testification them that individuals are coming to testify and then subpoena deuces kick them they're coming in with a document okay so those are case law principles now um, before I move to this next slide I want to just um, bring your attention to figure 92 and figure 93 on pages 268. Uh, and 269, um, you have uh, an example of a subpoena ad testis tandem and a subpoena deuces tecum, how they may look. Because in the health information management area, you may have to be involved in releasing information and may um, end up getting some of these that you have to respond to. All right, so there's some examples. All right, so moving on, we know that the medical record is the a legal business record. And it's going to be very important, um, this thing about maintaining that record in the normal course of business when we uh, encounter different legalities. Um, and so when we're talking about maintaining that record in the uh, normal course of business, we have to maintain that record according to the many different standards that we have to be compliant with, like your accreditation, 
your professional practice standards and other regulations like your conditions of participation and those types of things. We have to make sure that we are in compliance with these and this is going to cover uh, include both paper and electronic uh, records. So um, all of this applies. Um, also, um, what was I going to say? Um, there are a couple of other extra things uh, in addition to, uh, for electronic record, um, then your paper records and your book goes into those uh, as well. Um, when we're talking about those electronic records, they're on page 270 um, dealing with what type of computer they are um, stored on, making sure that, that is acceptable, how they're going about creating that EMR, how the information is recorded, all of those things um, are, are applicable to your um, EMR being able to fall under saying they're in the normal course of business um, as well as other things like uh, making sure we have backup storages, um, how we're copying the documents that contain signatures, um, making sure there's no way that the electronic records can be altered, making sure they are just as confidentially kept as your paper records would be, making sure there's no unauthorized access, um, making sure we have appropriate authentication um, methods, um, and we have procedures in place for maintaining our system. All of this is going to come into play as well with your electronic records. Now, um, we, have, we have been talking about confidentiality. That's a big part of legal aspects. Um, confidentiality of your information um, and it falls in line with your HIPAA privacy and security uh, provisions. And so we know that the information that uh, is generated from an in the interaction with a provider uh, and a patient is privileged communication um, and that patients have a right to confidentiality for the uh, due to those communications. And so anything that we are disclosed or for the most part, everything that is uh, being disclosed, we have to have patient authorization. There are some exceptions, but for the most part, uh, patient authorization uh, is required. And if there is a situation that occurs and which violates that, then we have what we call a breach of confidentiality. All right, and then your HIPAA laws uh, come into play because the patient's right is to the expectation of privacy with their um, information, um, and we also have to have security safeguards in place to make sure that the, that patient's information is protected and safe. Um, your Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act helps us um, to do that. Uh, if you notice, we always talk about HIPAA and Health Information Portability and Accountability Act. We say that. Um, and actually, there are several um, titles that are included under um, this HIPAA legislation, you got Title One through Five. The one that we talk about um, most often is when we're talking about that confidentiality piece is that Title um, Two, which is the administrative simplification. But these other titles that are not talked about as often uh, are also fall under HIPAA. Now, again, we talk about portability um, and accountability uh, when we talk about HIPAA. And basically, that portability component uh, kind of dealt with when we had um, people who were employed and um, they changed jobs, and we wanted a way to ensure that they can maintain continuity of their health insurance coverage, even though they may uh, change their jobs, and even even though they may have pre-existing medical conditions, that spoke to that portability piece. Uh, of HIPAA. Um, um, then you have the accountability piece that kind of dealt with um, that aspect of protecting the integrity of the health data, the availability, and the confidentiality. Um, and so that's where your portability and accountability come in play in your uh, HIPAA legislation. Um, 
also your um, medical liability reform piece comes into play um, as well and um, basically kind of dealing with that um, medical malpractice suits and, and some protections for physicians that a lot of them kind of were falling off due to the increase in expenses of the, that uh, type of situation that it was also covered here. Now, outside of that, um, you, a big uh, component of your HIPAA would be your privacy rules and your security rules. All right, when we talk about um, your privacy, your HIPAA privacy rule, uh, it looks at uh, what we call well, covered entities. That's an important aspect. When we talk about covered entities in respect to your privacy rule as well as your security rule, these are the individuals who have to maintain compliance to the privacy rule and security rule. Your covered entity, it, covered entities include your uh, healthcare providers. Um, that uh, operate in electronic form with a lot of their transactions, your health plans, and your health care clearinghouses. All right? And we're talking about, in terms of privacy, that patients protect their health information. This is information that makes that if we get, if a person obtains this information, they can identify that individual, like your name, your address, your med Medicaid ID number, your date of birth, social security number, those types of elements. Uh, what we call protected health information. Um, and this is the type of uh, uh, things that will, that authorization for disclosing of information comes in uh, to play. Under your privacy rule, it's going to protect this health information no matter what form it's in, whether it be electronic, paper, or verbal. It's going to fall under the privacy rule. The privacy rule also um, indicates that patients have specific rights. Your book um, does go through briefly several things in terms of patients' rights. Like for instance, it tells covered entities that they have to have a uh, explanation in writing as to how they're going to use and disclose that patient's uh, information. Um, this does not apply to inmates in a correctional facility because they don't have those those types of rights. All right. Um, your book also gives you a note on how an individual has the right to revoke an authorization that they may give at any time in written format. Um, another right is where it deals with redisclosure of uh, PHI, which basically lends itself to once that covered entity releases that in, uh, information um, to whoever that in, uh, organization that they have authorization to disclose to. They are uh, no longer to be protected by that privacy rule once that's disclosed. All right? Also, patients have a right to their information. They can obtain copies of them. They can request amendments. And HIPAA says that a covered entity has to respond to the um, Amendment request and release of information request uh, within 60 days. Also, um, when a, in, a covered entity has a third part of our business associate that they uh, conduct business with, they have to ensure that that third party of that business associate is applying appropriate safeguards with the information that they're giving them access to. This is their responsibility under HIPAA. Also, the covered entity um, in terms of disclosures to family members, um, if that becomes necessary, they have to disclose information that's only directly related to whatever that patient, um, uh, whatever their involvement with that patient is, nothing beyond that. Um, they also can disclose PHI to notify five family members of a patient's location and general condition or death. This is allowable um, under HIPAA. When there's a deceased patient, then they must protect um, the, the information of that deceased patient for up to two years after that patient dies. Um, 
in the event that um, going on to another right, in the event um, in the event that that patient is unavailable, then it's up to the professional judgment of the covered entity to determine what uh, needs to be disclosed for in the best interest of that uh, patient. Right? If we have what we call whistleblowers, say something is going on of an illegal nature or there may be a violation um, on a person's job and they decide that they need to divulge that uh, as a whistleblower, then this is not going to be considered a violation on the HIPAA. They get a pass when this is done in good faith that there's some unlawful act going on. All right? Um, authorization, we talked about that for most instances, except for those exceptions that we're going to discuss. They have to obtain um, patient authorization, but for uh, they do not have a covered entity does not have to obtain uh, patient authorization for TPO treatment, payment, and healthcare operations. So this is the normal activities of getting the job done with that patient care. Those type of activities they um, do not have to actually obtain a patient authorization for that. However, your book lets you know that most times providers obtain uh, authorization for, for TPO purposes anyway. They also tell you that um, you need to make note of or uh, differentiate between a consent to TPO um, versus a patient authorized authorization to disclose PHI. That is different. All right. Okay. Now, um, another thing here, and we feel under um, privacy rules, um, the privacy rule does not um, have like hard um, core specifics or just very. It, it has some flexibility in the way. Uh, in how they allow different entities to construct their policies and procedures in terms of the privacy rules. So they throw those standards out there on what need, what types of functionality and things that need to occur, but they kind of let cover entities go about how they want to implement these things uh, themselves. All right? So they can kind of construct their own policies and procedures in relation to this. And they may have to make sure that their employees are trained as to what um, is going on in terms of HIPAA privacy and privacy procedures. And they also need to have a privacy officer in place um, who's going to be responsible for this process. This is according to HIPAA, so a privacy officer of some type is required. The other thing that concept that they talk about under the privacy rule is that of um, disclosing the minimum necessary, meaning uh, even if we have authorized disclosure, we're only going to disclose with just the right amount of information, not more and nothing less. All right. Um, I would like to turn your attention. There's a lot of figures here. Uh, on page 274, uh, figure 9-4 is an example of a privacy notice where they're uh, telling the patient um, how they're handling their information. We talked about that in detail. And then on page 276, you have figure 9-5, which is a consent form for TPO versus on the opposite page, on page 277, you have a, a authorization for disclosing uh, protected health information. That's in Figure 9-6. So you can take a look at those and see what components are required under um, HIP, the HIPAA privacy rule. Now, um, the other thing that is important here is that when violations occur, there can be penalties that are applicable. Um, your book talks about there being, you can have civil monetary penalties and federal criminal penalties. With your civil monetary penalties, you have uh, $100 per violation up to $25,000 per person per year for each requirement or per prohibition violated. That's on the civil penalties. On the federal penalties, which are criminal, you have up to 
fifty thousand and one year in prison uh, for obtaining or disclosing protected health information, up to one hundred thousand, up to five years in prison if you obtain this PHI under false pretenses, and up to two hundred fifty thousand and ten years in prison if you are disclosing this information PHI. Um, with the intent to sell, transfer, or use to your advantage or gain off of some malicious harm. All right, and they uh, expanded this in 2010. Now, what we need to also note here, uh, kind of changing venues, your book brings out in the note on page 278 about how your psychotherapy notes, those are uh, notes that are not a part of the medical record, and even when um, a release of information request comes along with a patient authorization. This is records that we do not release unless there's an authorization that specifically uh, requests um, psycho notes and it has to be approved. So just a general authorization for information for the patient's medical record that is not uh, released. Your book also um, tell you so you see similar things for AIDS and HIV. Um, situations as well, and your HIPAA provides a, a privacy rule on that. And sometimes your state law, because HIPAA is on a federal level, may have stricter laws on that than your federal law or your HIPAA law, and then you're going to follow that state law. Right? So that's your privacy rule. Now your HIPAA security rule um, has standards and safeguards that protect information health information that's selected, maintained, used, or transmitted in an electronic format, right? So it was put in place to cover electronic uh, information, and CMS is overseeing um, this in terms of your security rules. Now, one of the big things they talk about is that electronic signature, and when we deal with electronic information, and um, one of the big things is it for that signature to be encrypted. Um, be able to have an encryption and decryption, making sure um, that we can authenticate that signature. So when we talk about encryption, um, we pretty much are um, saying is that that is encoded. You use a computer file to encode it or it scrambles it, and the only person who can unscramble it is the authorized recipient of that message. Once that message is transmitted electronically, that uh, authorized recipient can decode or decrypt that message um, and then they compare um, the decoded thing with the transmitted part and if, if it me measures out then um, that says that the signer has been proven. So that's way, the way that encryption and decryption um, works. So that digital signature is very important in the electronic format because we need to authenticate um, those documents. Um, your covered entity, and again, that's um, your health plans, your providers, and your clearinghouses have to make sure um, that the integrity, the confidentiality, and availability of your electronic information is protected. <clears throat> and they have to take into consideration. Um, that they don't allow improper access, but also that there is no um, illegal interception of that in in information during electronic transmission as well. So that's a different dynamic um, than, say, for say, paper records. All right. So they have to look at different things in terms of their policies and procedures when it, when it comes to um, who's authorized. Um, to use uh, that electronic information, so they need to control their access. They have to have some type of tracking procedure in place. Um, they have to have limit the record storage access to authorized users. They may need to make sure they have the storage areas locked at all times. And they also need to have the original record remain in the facility at um, all times. They even tell you about if they are required to produce that information for a uh, court. Um, if they need to make a copy, then they will um, copy that record. If they need the original, then um, they have to retain a copy at the uh, HIM department 
and they have to make sure or ensure that that record is safely transported um, by putting it in a locked storage container. And then they have to make sure that it remains in the custody of that HIM professional until it's entered into evidence uh, in the court proceedings. Now, under the security rule, they have several safeguards. It's made up of, of, of safeguards. You got administrative safeguards, which kind of deals with the management of those policies and procedures dealing with that security rule. You got physical safeguards um, that kind of deal with um, your actual um, things that your information is being stored on, like your devices. Um, it looks at how they access the actual physical location, um, like your, your workstation, all those things are following a physical safeguard. Um, and then your technical safeguard deals with um, like your um, login, um, your um, log off, and uh, any kind of technology type things that help control access um, of that information. Um, maybe the tag you use to get in and all those types of things. Anything technology wise that will fall under your technical um, safeguards. You have a table 9-1 on page 281 through 2 uh, and um, you have 9-1-B and 9-1-C on 282, 283 um, respectively that breaks down your administrative safeguards, your physical safeguards, uh, and your technical um, safeguards. Okay. All right. So um, after once that's on your table. Um, we also have, um, I bring your attention to your um, table, that's your table 9-2 on page 284 and 285, and I think it goes to 286. And all that table is, is very, it has a lot of information um, covering different laws. And legislation that impacts our health information management. So in that first column, you got the law and your regulation and description of that. Uh, and, and basically, these all um, deal with the protection of that health information. Um, you got federal and state laws and regulations here. I'm not going to read through all of them. You can um, look at those. Um, The conditions of participation are included, and we talked about that quite a bit. Um, that's at the top of page 284, and it breaks those down. Um, you got your um, Federal Patient Self Determination Act, um, that's your advanced directive. Um, that you got your Privacy Act of 1974. You just you need to read through all of those. Those are very important because they're going to speak to how. Uh, why we do what we do in terms of maintaining um, that uh, information the way we do in order to protect that information. So you got the federal and, and state laws and regulations on one hand, and then you also have um, those uh, maintained by the privacy sector. So, and um, that's in Table um, 9-3. I think that's on page... Let's see the state law. So you got 9-2 federal legislation and 9-3 is your state law. That's on page 286. And you see they got a couple there. Mental health records, reportable diseases, reportable event retention of records. Um, so you got federal and state protection and then you got different things that come across through your private um, sector. So you got your laws like the Privacy Act. And then you got state laws that deal with your confidentiality. Uh, how your um, and and it speaks to the different types of context of what's going on in terms of keeping information confidential um, and with what type of information 
that can be shared without patient authorization. And then you got your private sector that is also regulated by um, laws that address specific types of organizations. That's in your table 9.3 on page 286. So these slides here are um, just listing out a lot of that legislation that's in tables 9.2 and in tables 9.3, and you need to read over um, those. All right. Now, um, releasing of uh, protected health information, release of information is a large component in an HIM department. We have to ensure that we appropriately disclose uh, information that is requested of us. All right, and when we talk about um, disclosing, that just means releasing of that information. We have to appropriately release that patient's P, uh, HI um, and make sure that things that are not supposed to be released, that we don't release them. All right. We also have to pay attention to uh, misfiles. Misfiles can be very important. That's why we put so many controls in place to minimize misfiles because if you put, um, and not just misfile in terms of putting a patient record in the wrong place, but we don't want to put wrong documents in the wrong person's records because this subjects us to the possibility of um, when it, that patient's record is requested or uh, release of information is requested, we end up releasing someone, another individual's information to, to the wrong party. And then we have a breach of confidentiality. Um, also, we want to ensure that we uh, any internal documents that we may be using in our facility is not mistakenly included in the record. For example, like the incident reports. We talked about that on an occasion. Incident reports are not to be placed in a medical record. Once you do something like that, then that makes that information or that document subject to disclosure upon third party request for information. So it's very important that that does not happen. So that is also of uh, consideration. We also want to make sure that we exclude deviant, aberrant statements about a patient not being a record. So if we say, for example, your book was saying something about you have a patient that might be might be difficult to deal with, you don't want to put anything, document anything in that record that may say that they are nasty old lady or something that's very negative that's not really clinical, um, but you're speaking about something subjective and it's not very nice. We don't want to do that because once that's put in there, you know, according to our rules for documentation, it cannot be deleted or destroyed. We can only amend around it, but you can always see that in the record. So that's um, important. Um, that everyone realizes that. We also need uh, to pay attention to ownership of that record. Um, health care provider owns the medical record and the patient owns the information. And we have discussed that on several um, occasions as well. So we need to be sure are aware of when we need an authorization and when we do not need an authorization. Any types of circumstances or exceptions. Um, we also need to realize what accounting or disclosures of PHI involves or requires prohibition on redisclosure of the information and also that of keeping up with the, what we call release of information laws. Now, more often than not, a patient authorization is going to be are required prior to disclosing information. And your state law, um, if they're stricter than the federal law, can supersede, supersede your uh, federal legislation. All right? Now, your book takes a couple of pages to talk about um, authorizations when they are and when they're not required. Now, um, basically, it, it covers a couple of different areas here and uh, talking about when uh, authorization is not required. And this is usually a very eye-opening situation uh, for a lot of students because 
they always thought or felt that authorization is required for all um, types of disclosures of information, but this simply is not true according to HIPAA. Um, a couple of areas here they talk about, um, for example, health oversight agencies. Um, may a covered entity can disclose to them for different things like audits, say for a quality improvement organization, or for criminal investigations, uh, for inspections like through OSHA, all right, some kind of health inspection, for um, disciplinary actions, maybe for a physician, for criminal proceedings, um, and other activities um, that are appropriate for an oversight system like for CMS or some, of some nature of that. Um, in, in some context of that, um, ooh, I got tongue tied. Or uh, in some area, a former area of that, like CMS. Now, so health oversight activities, public health activities, all right, where there um, we have certain communicable diseases that we have to report. Um, when there's some child abuse or neglect going on, then we have to report with the Food and Drug Administration if they have some type of product recall, product recall defects or something and they have better disclose information to contact certain individuals about um, product recall or defects or something that may harm them, then that information is disclosed without authorization. Um, workers' comp, um, it lets them report those type of, um, when you have your employer, um, information about the employee to determine whether they uh, can get work, uh, workers comp and they can send that information. But a lot of times you may have state laws that may uh, prohibit that, so you have to check with, um, it varies by state. Now also with law enforcement, again, it's some criminal things going on like uh, victims of abuse, neglect, domestic violence. Man, the information um, might have to be released um, about that, and the book gives you a couple of bullet points of when they can disclose um, information to law enforcement, uh, like some like gunshot wounds is one. If they go into the emergency room and you've been shot with a gun, they're gonna report that. Okay, um, if they're in the midst of an investigation and uh, they need some information to locate a suspect or a fugitive or a witness or some something of that nature, it gives the uh, several bulleted information that, of things that can be disclosed. Name and address, date of birth, ABO blood type, type of injury, those type of things. Um, then there are a couple of things that tell you in the note on page 289 at the top one, in the left hand column that says that the covered entity may not disclose for identification or location purposes, any PHI relating to DNA or DNA analysis, dental records, or typing, samples, and analysis of body fluids or tissues um, dealing with this law enforcement. All right. And it goes on further to say that uh, they can disclose information um, If that individual uh, may be a victim of some type of crime, um, if that um, victim agrees with that, or if they can't obtain that agreement due to maybe that patient is incapacitated, um, then um, then they may can um, divulge some of that information um, based on a couple of different things within a context. Um, also, your covered entities can disclose um, a dead person's information to law enforcement if they think it, that that death has occurred due to a crime. Um, a lot of times when you have a suspicious type death, then that case becomes um, under the supervision of a coroner or a medical examiner. And I don't know if everyone knows that. Uh, sometimes your coroner, well, your medical examiner is always a physician, whereas your coroner may or may not um, be a physician, but they are um, a public officer, basically. All right, they're elected individuals, they are a public officer, but they both deal uh, with trying to find out the cause of suspicious death.
Okay. Now, um, your authorization um, is not required um, when you have a court order, um, but only the PHI expressly authorized for release by the court order. Um, and then you have your subpoena due to take them. Um, that you don't have to have a, a patient authorization for uh, as well. Identification and location purposes, you can divulge this information with authorization. Um, when we talk about identification and location, um, say name and address, date and place of birth, social security number, ABO blood type, we just talked about this type of injury when we're talking about uh, with law enforcement. Um, what information they could divulge. Then it also tells you about uh, the identified information. This is information where you have um, um, taken out all of the identifiable information about a patient and so they just only have um, general information but no way to identify the patient. You don't have to have um, patient authorization for that. When you're dealing with your coroners, your medical examiners, funeral directors, and so forth, you don't have to have patient authorization um, to release that information. On uh, research purposes, we do not need a release of information as long as that research has been uh, approved through the Institutional Review Board, IRB, our Privacy Board, um, then there's no authorization needed. Uh, unless they are doing some type of research um, that is going to actually include treatment of an individual, then authorization would be needed. Um, FDA, we kind of mentioned that before, um, when there are some adverse events due to product recalls, defects in product, products and stuff like that, then authorization is not needed when they're trying to locate that uh, individual. Um, you got different governmental um, functions that are uh, do not need authorization, like dealing with Medicare and Medicaid. They give you a whole list here. Military veteran activities and so forth. We talked about workers' compensation um, and how um, on that federal level um, they're not required. Uh, to have an authorization, but um, it's telling you here in your note there at the bottom of 291 that many state laws prohibit disclosure of that PHI for workers' compensation unless that patient has signed an authorization. So in that case, the state law preempts the uh, federal law when it's in a stricter parameter. Alright, and so in all other instances, pretty much you want to have to have an authorization disclose that PHI. So we just kind of covered different areas in which you do not need authorization. Just about every so everything other than I just mentioned, you do need authorization for attorney requests, employers, government agencies. Um, when you have we talked about not needing authorization for treatment payment authorization. However, if you have providers who did not render care to that patient, then they're going to need an authorization. Um, HIV related information, authorization is needed. IRS authorization um, is needed. Law enforcement for any other activities um, outside of the ones we discussed that no authorization is needed, they don't need authorization. For um, marketing um, communication, um, when we're talking about um, marketing communication, um, say they are trying to sell some type of product. Um, in service, um, you can't that that um, cover entity can't sell that information to some kind of marketing company or something uh, of, of that nature. And anything that uh, is allowed um, under HIPAA, then they're going to have to include that information in their privacy notice in terms of how they're going to use that uh, patient's information. Um, patient or patient representative, um, except for those times, we talked about those exceptions when they do not need an authorization. 
Um, we already talked about research. If it included treatment to the individual, authorization is going to be um, needed. Um, Third-party payers, except for when it's PPO, treatment patient and, oper uh, and operations. And we already talked about workers' comp in um, reference to state laws. We often um, require um, that authorization. Um, we we talked about all the, the um, authorizations that um, are needed and when they're not needed. Um, and we also talked a little bit about uh, the patient's rights and that they own their information and the uh, provider owns the medical record. And so with that right of that individual, they can access their information. Um, except for, we talked about the psychotherapy notes. Um, if there are some information um, that uh, action against them in, in terms of civil, criminal, or administrative, and then also PHI maintained by a covered entity that's subject to CLIA, the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments of 1988. Uh, your book also um, goes into a little bit about talking about emancipated minors, because so usually minors have. Um, don't really have a right to sort of up under their parents, but if they're an emancipated minor, then they are considered um, to be legally an uh, adult, and so they um, have rights as a, that of an adult. Your book tells you that a covered entity can deny an individual right to access his or PH, um, to his or her PHI. Um, when we talked about those psychotherapy notes, if we if they feel um, that that individual's life is in danger, they may have to use their professional uh, judgment, or they think some type of substantial harm is going on, then they can um, use their professional judgment and not release that information uh, to that patient. That's an, a, an exception to your right to access your own information. Um, so they also can deny um, a person right to their information, say, in the midst of a research um, deal. And once that person had agreed to to um, be uh, participate in that uh, research process, um, and it, within that agreement, it tells them that they will not be able to access their information during the participation of that research and then they uh, give them the date in which their right will be reinstated, then once they agree to that, if they try to ask for their information within that time frame, then they will be denied um, the right to access of that information. Another time when um, a the patient's right can be not denied to access um, is when that a PHI was obtained from someone other than the covered entity under a promise of confidentiality, right? And and then when the covered entity is a correctional institution, again we talked about inmates not really having um, those rights. Prohibition on redisclosure. Um, Basically, uh, this is referring to, um, say, for example, um, you have one facility that gets uh, some information from another facility in terms of treatment, uh, payment operations. Say, uh, a person is transferred from the hospital to a lower level of care, and the record follows the information from that hospital follows them. Then when a person requests their record from the lower level um, healthcare organization, that healthcare organization is not going to release information that was originated from the hot fed hospital. Um, this is where we talk about them, the covered entity being prohibited from redisclosing another entity's copies of PHI unless authorized to do so. All right?
product. Tracking the disclosure of uh, PHI. It talks about where HIPAA um, requires us to maintain some type of log or, or software. It could be automated or manual in which we are tracking um, the release of PHI, or those disclosures. We have to have an accounting of the disclosures. And we have to keep this information for six years. All right? Uh, and your book tells you if an entity releases PHI to the same entity for the same reason, then you are keep, you'll have that first disclosure documented, and then you document the number of times, uh, number of disclosures made during that period. All right? You, uh, patients have the right to request this information or this document in terms of what, um, what information has been disclosed over that period of six years. Um, they can request that information. If an individual um, requests this um, disclosure log, then um, the cover entity has 60 days to um, fulfill that request. They can extend it 30 days out if they need to. Um, and if there is a delay, they have to put that in writing and also um, notify that patient of why there is a delay. It tells you as well that they have to provide um, one free accounting report during any 12-month period. And then after that, they can charge a fee um, for that information. Um, same thing with your um, release of information request. Um, you can charge, the entity can charge a fee for copying and stamps and posters and those types of things as well. Um, this is going to complete the lecture on legal aspects of health information management.